Hey, this is David Jackson. I'm the pastor of New Vintage Church. I just wanted to say welcome to our online messages. I hope that you are blessed today as you listen to what God has to say in your life. Hey, it's so great to be with you guys here at New Vintage Church. How cool is this? My name's Tim Jacobs. Yeah, yeah. My name's Tim Jacobs, and um, you, some of you guys may know me. Some of you, a lot of you probably don't, but I... I actually was, until very recently, the lead pastor at Compass Church down in Goodyear and uh, recently took on a role with our denomination called the Evangelical Free Church of America, of which you guys are a part. Actually, our church had the privilege of starting this church, I don't know, about six years ago or so. And uh, so it is so awesome to be able to be here and see what God's doing. And I love this, by the way. This fired me up. The, uh, the whole... English and Spanish congregations coming together. That's a beautiful thing. And I think about when we look at all the challenges in, our, in the world right now, especially in our nation we have with immigration and, and, the, and all the issues of division, it really once again proves to me that the gospel is the unifying factor, is the only unifying factor in our culture. And you guys are doing it. You guys are making it happen. Am I, am I on, by the way? Can you all hear me okay? I just want to make sure. Am I good? Because I can project, man. I can be loud. <laughs> but anyway, so I just recently started as this wonderfully exciting job called the district superintendent, right? It's like, wow, that's a, like, what does that mean? So basically, my job is to kind of, we have about 200 congregations in our district spread over about seven states, and so my job is to kind of strengthen our existing congregations and to help start new ones by helping train leaders and all that kind of stuff. So I was so excited that David invited me to come today, and then to hear that you guys are meeting now in the movie theater. I love it. I mean, I mean, I was like, well, because I've, I've heard about churches meeting in a movie theater, but never actually been a part of one. So I, I was like kind of concerned because I brought my daughter, by the way, to my daughter, Cambria, over there. She's my 16-year-old daughter. She gets her looks from her mother, so good, it's very good for her. Um, and, uh, but our, the rest of our family is continuing to worship at Compass, um, but I kind of, when, when I'm here in town, I'll, I grab my daughter, and she kind of is my little, my little partner, and we go around and, and, ch- and look at our various churches. But when I was thinking about church in a movie theater, I thought, man, this is going to be interesting. So I got online to see if I could reserve my seat, you know, and, uh, but I wasn't able to do that. But then here's the question I'm wondering, and I want you to be honest. Honestly, do, do you guys sneak food into the service? I just, yeah, 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 you do, don't you? You know, but I, I don't know. I was like, can I, can I bring, like, because I don't want to pay eight bucks for raisinets, you know? And so I thought, can I, like, bring a muffin or something? Will they get mad at me? No, I'm totally joking. But this is kind of cool because it's a different thing to be here in the movie theater. And I'm so glad to be with you guys. I love what you're doing. And you don't realize what you have. I get the opportunity to go to different churches around, you know, in California, different places. And, man, there's some churches that you're going, I mean, is there, is there a pulse here? It's like, is there anybody alive? But this church has got life, and it fires me up. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, and, and I will tell you, again, as I come, I come to you today on behalf of the Evangelical Free Church of America. And the reason I bring that up is because all I want to talk to you about today are two words, evangelical and free. Because those two words may be the most important thing about you and the most important thing about this church. Now, I understand that at first glance you hear, okay, evangelical free church of America. What, like, what, that's a mouthful. Like, what does that even mean? Does that mean that your church is, like, free of evangelicals? Like, caffeine-free or sugar-free? And it's like, what does that even mean? But you guys are a part of an organization called the Evangelical Free Church of America. And I want to talk to you about what these words mean and why they matter. That's it. So when you walk out today, you should have a clear understanding of evangelical and free. And here's the thing. The reason why it's important is because in case you didn't know, if you go to this church and you're, you're committed here, you would be considered what is called an evangelical. And the problem that means is, in case you hadn't noticed, in case you haven't looked around in the media, if you're an evangelical, you have a bit of a PR problem. 
right? The world kind of tends to think that if you're an evangelical, you're a little crazy. In fact, it's become basically an insult by the press and the popular culture, right? Oh, you're one of those evangelicals. In fact, there's an article just a few months ago from a, a magazine called The Atlantic, which isn't exactly a Christian publication. And this guy, he's a professor at Baylor University. He, the title is, Evangelical Has Lost Its Meaning. And he says that in most, people, in most people's minds, the word evangelical conjures up the image of basically a white guy who, who drives a truck and owns a gun and votes Republican and loves America. It was kind of funny because I was preaching this at a, at, the, at a church in a really small town in California. And as soon as I said that, the whole place went, yeah! And I was like, whoa, time, time out. Like, okay, there's nothing wrong like with being a white guy because I'm a white guy and I do own a gun and, and I, I did drive a truck and then I had kids and now I drive a Honda Civic. But, but it, hey, they're great cars. They get great gas mileage, but I had to get rid of the truck. And, 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 I, and I do love America, and we, hey, we live in a red state, right? So there's nothing inherently wrong with any of those things, but here's the deal. None of those things make a person an evangelical. None of those things. How you vote, your ethnicity, whether you love America, whether you own a gun, None of those things make you an evangelical. So that's very important to understand. So what does it mean then to be an evangelical and why does it matter? Well, we begin to get a clue from the, in the book of Mark from the very beginning. In fact, the very first phrase. So here's Mark. He's writing the story of Jesus. All you'd never ever need to know about the heart of God. This is amazing. All you'd ever need to know about the heart of God, who God is, why you're here, what God wants to say to you. And so Mark is writing this story because he's been witness to these things with Jesus. And this is the first thing that he says right out of the gate. He says in Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And right there in the very first phrase of the very first um, gospel book, you know, the gospel of Mark, we get the very reason why we're called evangelical. Because the word evangelical means good news. It comes from the word gospel, which means good news. So right there it says the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the good news. And it's the word euangelio. So gospel or evangelical comes from the Greek word euangelio, which basically means good news or good message. So if you have, a, if you have good news or a good message... Usually that is accompanied by a messenger. And so the word evangelical, by the way, the word evangelical has the word inside it contained angel, right? Isn't that crazy? It has the word angel. So that's what angels are. Angels are what? Messengers. So you remember just we had Christmas last month, right? The angels, what do they do? They go to the shepherds and what do they say? We bring you what? Good news of great joy that will be for all the people because that is their job. They are messengers. So, we, so this is an amazing thing. So if you are an evangelical that has nothing to do with whether you drive a truck or own a gun or vote Republican or however you, or, or anything about you as an American citizen or whatever, has nothing to do with that. If you are an evangelical, that means you are by definition a messenger of good news. That's what God created you to be. That's your identity and that is your role. You are not a messenger of bad news. You are a messenger of good news. That is your core identity. Now, let me ask you a question about that. How does that differ from how we often see ourselves? Because sometimes, you know, like if you're a Christian, you can feel like the culture is kind of getting darker and darker. And so rather than thinking of yourself as a messenger of good news, you see yourself as a guardian of a dying tradition, right? The last remnant of a bygone era. And it kind of feels good to be like that, right? I'm one of the few that's left. 
while the world continues to go downhill. And the problem with that mentality is that causes us to roll up the drawbridges and to hunker down and to isolate and to go further and further away from where the world is in our, in our minds or whatever else and to become more and more compartmentalized because we see ourselves as in a defensive posture rather than, whoa, 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 hang on. The whole reason I'm here, if I'm an evangelical, a messenger of good news, is to play exactly that role. We are gospel people. But it doesn't end there. In fact, this is where it kind of gets good because Mark continues on because it starts off, he says, look, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. But then it continues and it says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, will you see right out of the gate in verse 2, what does God do? He sends. He sends a messenger ahead of Jesus to tell everyone that the good news is coming. Now, we get a clue in the heart of God in that phrase because that's the thing that God always does. He sends. God is ascending God. That's one thing this guy from uh, Trinity Seminary, Dr. Craig Ott, wrote a book about our, our whole denomination's mission statement which is multiplying transformational churches among all people. And he wrote a whole book about it. And he says at the outset, we have to know who God is. And one of the things about God, what he does is, if you want to understand him more, is he sends. He sends Jesus. He sends the prophets. He sends angels. And he sends us. And so that's one of the things that he does. Now, why that blows me away is when he sends us with good news, he asks us to share it. Now, I don't know about you, but... When you have good news, don't you like being the one to share it, right? Like when you get good news, like, oh, I can't wait to tell someone about the good news, right? And it's the worst thing when you have good news and someone else tells it before you have the chance to. This is a, it's like, you know, you're sitting there with your spouse and you bring the kids together and you say, hey, kids, you know, and you're like, you're going to tell them, you know, something really exciting. And you say, hey, kids, guess what? And then your spouse jumps in, we're going to Disneyland. And you're like, no, yeah, it was my job to tell him. You jumped in. I, went, I wanted to be the one, right? And it's frustrating when you're like, I wanted to see their reaction. I wanted to look at me because I have this good news and it's exciting for me. And when I think about that's built into our nature, when we have something good that we want to share it, that, that God himself would, would certainly most be willing to say, hey, I, I would love to be the one to share this directly. But he says, no, I'm going to let you share it. It's such good news. But I'm not going to share it directly. I want you to share it. I'm sending you to share it. That's an interesting thing, right? Because, and again, I'm, I'm, all I'm doing is saying, look, this is the core of who we are. This is the core of what we're about. And so the essence of being an evangelical is one who is sent here. Now, how did, why does that matter? Because you might be here from, you might have moved here just from California. Like I moved from California, my wife and I did like 18 years ago. And some people, you move from all over the country, right? And this is where everyone's moving to right now, Arizona and a few other states as well. Surprise, it's growing like crazy. The whole West Valley is growing like crazy. And you may get here and you go, you know, I don't even know why I'm here. Well, I don't know why you're here either. I can't tell you personally, individually, like your own specific reason. But I can tell you this. If you're here, it's because God sent you here. God sent you here. Your life has purpose and it has meaning. You have been sent, and part of the reason you've been sent is to be a messenger of good news to all the other millions of people who are coming out here as well. That's, just, that's serious business. I can't really think of another more important reason that you are here than you have good news. Not bad news, good news. So what we have to do, and by the way, this is all over Scripture. If you look at John chapter 20, Jesus says to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? Why are you a holy nation? Why are you a chosen people? Why are you special? What, what's the reason? Look at this. So that, or just that you may declare. The purpose is that you may declare the praises of him. Who did what? Who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So then we have to ask the question, well, what is this good news about? What is this good news about? Of Jesus about? Well, we begin, we begin to get a picture in, the, in uh, Mark chapter 1 as we continue to read. 
So you say, well, okay, fine, good news, but what is the good news? I mean, it's about Jesus, but what is it about Jesus? Well, look at verse 4. It says, and so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, that's really interesting to me because of all the things, because remember, you know, you, if you're writing a book, you got to hook them, right? And the first couple verses or, you know, sentences aren't exciting. It's like, I'm done with this, right? Because, you know, People have the attention span of gnats, basically, right? So you got to get them quick. So it's like, why would John choose, right? There? There's a, hey, listen, there's some good news. There's a guy named Jesus, and here's how it started. God sent this dude to talk about forgiveness of sin. Why is that important? Well, and by the way, honestly, the whole rest of the book from there talks about how forgiveness of sin can be made possible. So, so when Jesus heals, when Jesus does miracles and heals people, he didn't just do them because he's like the guys on Christian TV, like Benny Hinn and those guys, he wants to make lots of money. No, he's doing it so that he, that he can show people that he actually has the ability and authority over all of creation to forgive, to forgive sin. If he can heal your withered hand, he can take away your sin. He's got authority over everything. So he does, he, a whole ministry is him making the case that he is the one who is worthy and capable of removing your sin from you to the point where he gets to the, the cross, he's dying on the cross to take upon his shoulders the sin of the world and then he dies and the Roman soldier who crucified him says what? Truly this man is the son of God. Like boom, mic drop. This is the guy who's capable of actually making this possible. So the good news then, and, 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 there's, and there's, the gospel has multi-facets to it, but one of the clearest pictures of the good news is the idea that Jesus Christ sets me free from my sin, meaning he sets me free from that which is killing me. Now that blows me away, because the number one problem you and I have is what? Not the fact that, you know, your, your uh, food at the restaurant wasn't any good or whatever, or your, your bills are too much. Your number one problem you have in your life is you're dying. You're dying. You and I are dying. That's the number one thing we have in common. And the reason we're dying is because of sin. The scripture says the wages of sin is what? Death. Right? So Jesus comes to separate us from that which kills us. So now we may still die physically, but we are never going to die spiritually. We have a guaranteed inheritance no matter where we've been or what we've done. It's not about being good. It's not about being holy. It's not about coloring inside the lines. It's not about caring for the environment. It's about, it's about you coming to the place in your life where you go, I have a sin problem. I want to put my faith in Jesus. And Jesus actually has the ability because he is the son of God, God in the flesh, to separate us from our sin forever. Now, the thing about sin, too, is that it doesn't just kill us in a, in, a, in a complete sense, like, you know, at the end of our lives we die and, you know, we spend eternity separated from God, but sin separates us from God now. And if God is a source of life, when I'm, when I'm involved in sin, my life begins to ebb away. And that's the thing we don't realize. The world chases after things that they want to fill them up. But as we, as we make decisions and our hearts are taken away from God, a part of us begins to die. And that's the thing we don't realize, is the soul gets eaten away slowly, right? And so, you know, but when we look at the world, most people say, hey, you know what? They, they sense there's something wrong, but they don't like to call it sin, right? They don't like to call it sin. In fact, most people say, I was born a good person. So, help, in fact, to help illustrate this, um, I made a little meme, and uh it's almost like a little bit out of date now, but you remember the angry woman and the cat? Okay, so I made this meme. Can you put it up on the screen there? Yeah, yeah. So this is how the world works, right? You can see over here, the woman's like, I'm a good person. Like, don't try to tell someone they're actually a sinner because most people see themselves as a good person, right? So she can see she's very angry because her goodness is being questioned. And the cat, his point is, no, actually, you're a sinner, but you can, you can be saved and rescued by the grace of God and the grace that's available through Jesus Christ. So the whole point is that, you know, we are people who desperately see there's something wrong with us. In fact, one of the things that, um, so I look at song lyrics once in a while, and I was, I was at the gym a while back, and uh, they were doing this thing where we all were doing the same workout together, and, and uh, you know, it's like we we're all dying, and they were blasting this music over the loudspeakers to try to motivate us. And I was listening to this one song, 
And it's about 10 years old, but the lyrics kind of grabbed me because I thought, wow, this guy doesn't really, he wasn't a Christian guy. He doesn't realize that he has captured the human condition quite well. He may not even call it sin, but he hit it pretty well. And it's, it's this song from this band called Three Days Grace. And the song is called Animal I Have Become. And I listened to this. I mean, it's kind of a cool song, though. It's a driving beat and everything. But, but uh, the lyrics say, I can't escape this hell so many times I've tried, but I'm still caged inside. Somebody get me through this nightmare. I can't control myself. What if you could see the darkest side of me? No one would ever change this animal I have become and help me believe it's not the real me. Somebody help me tame this animal. Wow. Wow. That is a very accurate and honest picture of the human condition. Maybe the crazy wild music like that isn't your thing. A few weeks ago, I was listening, I was having breakfast over the speakers. They were singing, they were playing Dean Martin. Dean Martin, he was singing, you're nobody till somebody loves you. You're nobody till somebody cares. You may be king, you may possess the world and its gold, but gold won't bring you happiness when you're growing old. The world is still the same. You never change it as sure as stars shine above. You're nobody till somebody loves you. So find yourself somebody to love. And once again, he is tapped into on our own, we waste away. On our own, we are helpless. On our own, we are nothing. And it's the love of a person who gives you value and meaning. How much more than the love of an eternal God? who breathes life into us. That is ultimately good news. See, the reason why people think that we say we have bad news is because a lot of Christians go around and say, well, listen, if you don't get it right, you're going to hell. And it's like, well, the average person goes, how do I get it right? I don't know how to get it right. But the reality is the default is bad news. The default for everybody is bad news. The default for everybody is death and destruction and separation and hell. But the good news is there is a way to be able to overcome it. There is a way out of it. There is a way to escape the impending doom. And that is the good news. There is a way to not be that animal anymore. There is a way to escape what you did last night or last year. There is a way to escape or to be, to, uh, to be redefined from what your friends say that you are. The drunk or the, uh, the promiscuous person. You don't have to be those things anymore. And that's the good news that we have. Let me ask you a question, if you're a Christian here today. Do you remember when you first got it? Do you remember when it first hit you that, that going to church, it's not just about being a Christian, it's about going to church and just being a good person, but you actually sense that it hits you that there is a God who loves me. And there is a God who took my sin upon his shoulders to separate me from it so that I would not be held responsible for it so that I could be released and I could live free from it and that, and that he would not hold my sins against me. I don't have to go to purgatory. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do a whole bunch of you know, painful, difficult things to try to earn God's love and respect like some crazy, abusive father. When Do you remember the moment that it first hit you? I'm free. I'm free. You know... Do you realize that because Jesus paid once for all for your sins, you cannot be tried twice for the same crime? You've, Jesus has already been tried in your place. He's already been found guilty. He's already been punished. It's already happened. It would be the worst injustice in the world for God to retry you and resentence you and, and, and you know for something that's already happened long ago. But it happened in your place. Jesus stood in your place. That's why I love it. Martin Luther calls it the great exchange, my sin for the righteousness of Jesus. This one guy from a few hundred years ago who also was blown away by this, he wrote a little poem about it. He says, payment God cannot twice demand, once from my bleeding surety's hand and then again from mine. He won't do it. And that's like a beautiful thing. Like every time I talk to someone about that, see, I can talk to them about Christian culture. I can talk to them about church. I can talk to them about what, and it's like Christian music. And it's like, they may not be interested at all, but the minute I talk about the gospel, whoa, I never heard that before. You mean that's that's who God really is? I've I've seen, I've had people come to tears in in the strangest of places. Do you mean that? That's what God wants to do in me? I'm not, 
I, that, that's not unavailable to me, even, even me. Yeah, even you. Even you. In fact, especially you. You guys, in America, we must resist the idea that Christianity is a, simply a system of morality. No, it's not a system of morality. It is a cosmic rescue mission. That's what it means to be an evangelical. You are on a cosmic, eternal rescue mission because if real people die without Jesus, they are going to a real hell. And that's not because God is mean. It's because God is just. And when you declare yourself to be God and you think, well, I don't need to submit myself to anybody and I'm still a good person, the problem with heaven is there's only room for one God. And if you went to heaven in that condition, you'd ruin the whole place. Heaven is a place where God is worshipped and revered for who he is, not you. And these are realities, right? But yet there is a way out of this, and it's through Jesus. This is why it says in 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why? That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. It's by his wounds you've been healed. So this kind of, so it's when, when you guys as New Vintage are, are looking, and I'm so excited about what you're doing, and you're in this movie theater, and, and you're, man, you've got this beautiful thing within Espanol, uh, uh, um, New Vintage in, Espa, in Espanol, and the, the idea that you grow in this place, and man, it just feels so much better than where you guys were before, and there's a future for you. But it's not just about, oh, let's just grow a church and just be like everybody else. It's like we have a message that actually transforms lives. And that's a beautiful thing. So I'll take the word evangelical because it means to be aggressive and proactive. It means to be proud of, of the fact that, wait a second, I have something that God's entrusted to me that actually works for anybody. So I'll take the word evangelical. I don't want to throw it out. I don't want to be like, oh, I'm not one of those guys. It's like, no, let me tell you what that actually means. The second thing is because I said I came to you talk to you about evangelical and free, Right? Well, the, the second thing is, what does the word free mean? Well, what's that about? Well, in my role in the, as the new district superintendent, they told me, they said, Tim, you have to get ordained. Now, um, you may not even know what that means. It's basically kind of like certified as somebody who, you know, is like entrusted to be a spiritual leader. Now, I just kind of circumvented that process because I went to, you know, I got a master's degree and a doctorate and my church in Goodyear didn't really care. And, uh, you know, so I was like, oh, I'll do it later because it doesn't really matter. If, and, I, and I kept pushing it off, pushing it off. Finally, they're like, Tim, if you're going to work for this organization, you've got to get ordained. So I'm like, fine, I'll do it. You know, you, the jig is up. I got I to gotta sit down and, you know, go through the process. I'm 45 years old, but sure, why not? So I, as part of it, I'm reading the books of the history of the evangelical free church. And at first I was like, oh, it's going to be the most boring thing. But... As I'm doing it, I'm learning some interesting things about our spiritual forefathers, the, the people who we could trace our spiritual lineage back to, right? Now, here's what's interesting about this to me is because, um, the, you know, a lot of the, these guys came from like Sweden and Norway and that sort of thing, you know, those Nordic countries. But here's, here's the thing I didn't know. Um, about how our denomination even got started. Because you think the denomination is like the most boring thing in the world. And I would agree with you until I learned a little bit about how it got started. Did you know that in Sweden, the nation of Sweden, there was a time when Protestantism was the state religion of the whole country. So the government and the church were in cahoots, not with the Catholic church, but the Protestant church. And so if a law was passed, it like had to be consistent with the Bible. And you're like, well, that's a great thing, right? Because right now there's all this stuff going on with like, you know, same-sex issues and all kinds of stuff that seems to go against what our understanding of the Bible is and what we believe the Bible says. So, we, so we're like, ah, this is kind of, the culture is at odds with Christianity. So you think it would be so great to live in a country like that. But you know what happens is, whenever the government gets involved in something, right? So if the government, if this church is run by the state, then if you had to go to church or you want to go to church, you had to go to a state-run church. Now, I don't know about you, but like, I don't want to go on a church to a church that's run by the same group that like runs the motor vehicle department, right? You know, it's like, then you're Pastor David, he'd be like a government employee, right? And the worship team, all government employees, you know, I don't know, if no offense if you're a government employee, because I was in the Air Force and, and still am for six years. So I, I'm, you know, technically a government employee. But I tell you, remember what Ronald Reagan said? He said, the scariest nine words you can ever hear are what? I'm from the government, and I'm here to help, right? 
So I was telling, so so the government ran the church. And 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 so what they did, because they were so concerned about people doing things their way, that in 1724 they passed a law called the Conventicle Law, which basically meant you cannot hold a small group Bible study in your home. It is illegal for you. You have to do all your church worship, all your worship in an actual church that we certify. You cannot study the Bible on your own in a home. They banned small groups. Can you believe that? That they did that. And your spiritual forefathers said, you're not going to tell us what to do. We want to study the Bible. We'll study the Bible wherever we want to, right? And, and I'm telling you, it was severe. If you got caught, they would, they would fine you, they would jail you, or they would banish you. Now you think, well, what's the big deal about banishing? If you, if you don't know what, how bad banishing would be, imagine if you have kids, if you have a teenager, if you have a 16-year-old daughter, taking her phone away forever. <laughs> what that would do to her. Like, that would be, be like, you would be basically banished, right? I mean, you would be like, well, she would go, oh my gosh, I've been banished from every, you can't get on Instagram, you can't do, you're, you're basically removed from all of life. That's what it would be. So there was severe penalties for having a Bible study in your home, but these guys didn't care. So you know what they did? They studied the Bible, and they said, we're going to get down to what it actually means. And when they, when they really studied for what it said, they realized this is good news. And the first thing they did was they began to reach out to the people around them. Say, I know you're going to the state church, and it, but it's really dry, and it's stale, and it's not. It's, all it is is a system. Let me tell you about the gospel. The first thing they did was reach out. And they were innovative. They were creative. And they were bold. And when you read about them, they're described as men and women. And surprising number of women, by the way, a surprising number of women risked a lot to be able to say, wait a second, the gospel is about good news. It's about being free from sin. It's not about what these guys think it is. And they spoke the language of their time. They asked questions like, hey, where is it written? If it's not in the Bible, then we don't have to worry about it. We do what the Bible says and we do what works. And they were innovative. Okay, now here's my, why I bring that up. Because the question I have is, when you look around at a lot of churches, and quite frankly, a lot of churches in our group, in our tribe, how did we get from a movement of people that were fresh, that were exciting, that were bold, they're like, yeah, we'll meet in movie theater, yeah, we don't have to do church like this, we want to reach people for Jesus, to, to a movement where there's a lot of Christians in a lot of churches that quite frankly sit there and they act just like the Swedish church back in the 1700s. They go, well, you have, there's a bunch of laws, and you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do church like this. And they, and they, and they defend, and they, they try to worship the past, they defend the past, they freak out about every, anything that's new, and they become just like the people that they left hundreds of years ago. And if, you're, if you don't have the gospel fresh in your heart, you'll become that person. You'll pass your own conventicle laws. You'll you'll look down at other Christians that are doing things new and fresh and different. You'll look down on people who are trying to speak the language in a way that the people in our time understand. So one of the things I want to challenge you with is if the gospel is really fresh and beating in your heart, you don't really care about protecting the past. Your only goal is to get the message out in a language that people can understand now which means you may have to say goodbye to some things that you're used to. You may have to get, move away from some things that brought you a lot of comfort if, if those things don't work anymore. That's what it means to be free. To be free means to be liberated, to be a messenger that is effective. It means it, to be liberated, to be somebody who can try new things and be bold and be brave. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm about transformation. You know, I bumped into this guy yesterday at Starbucks, and he's sitting there talking to one of our, he was a guy at our church in Goodyear, and he's been coming for about two years, and it's so great, because he, uh, he was living with his girlfriend, they had a couple kids, and they're, you know, nice people, but they weren't, they weren't walking with Jesus, they, they weren't even, didn't even really call themselves Christians, they weren't ever really planning on getting married, and they got a little flyer in the mail for our Halloween block party that we do. This is a couple years back. So they decide to, they say, oh, let's take the kids to this thing. And then so they go and they, you know, they do their thing. And then a couple of months later, they kind of hit the skids. They have some problems, fighting a little bit, kind of confused. And they say, you know what? Maybe we should try this church, you know, or try a church. And they say, well, what, where church should we go to? And they say, well, that Halloween block party, those, if those people put that thing on with those bouncers for the kids and the laser tag on, they're probably not that crazy of people, you know. So, so they, they go to our church. They, did what, they went and checked it out. They're like, man, this isn't what we thought. And so, so they kind of start engaging. They start meeting people. And everyone just kind of accepts them as they are, right? And then they, they say, 
um, you know, they start hearing like, hey, if you want to really live for Jesus, you know, there's, there's, a, it's, it, there's a life that God wants to, where you submit yourself to him. And part of that means in every area of your life, so sexually and everything else, which means, you know, if you have this woman in your life, you should probably marry her. And so he, he proposes to her, and then, oh, we'll get married in like a couple years. And, uh, and so a couple of people in our church, including me, we, kind of, we were just kind of gently encouraging him, like, why would you wait so long? Well, you know, because of benefits and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, well, you know, maybe God, will, maybe God will figure that out. And so he comes to us and says, you know what? We're going to speed the whole thing up. And they decide we're going to get married on Valentine's Day. It was two years ago. We're going to get married on Valentine's Day. But we don't have anything. We don't have any money. We don't know what to do. So our whole church or, or their small group and some of our staff came together and put on a wedding for them. Like on a, It was the coolest thing on a Thursday. We had some guy play the guitar and sing a couple songs. We had uh, one, our, our youth pastor did the ceremony. Their small group came and showed up. We had some woman in the, who was good at photography just kind of pro bono to take some pictures for him. And it was kind of a spur of the moment thing. But they're like, we want to do this. And it was so beautiful because you're watching God now restore and put together a family. And when I saw that, I went, man, this is so cool because, because this is one less family in the West Valley that's, that's, that's disjointed. This is one more, uh, there's two more kids now who have a mother and a father who are committed in a marriage relationship in the home. And it's beautiful what the gospel does, right? Because it rebuilds and restores and brings life. And so I saw him yesterday. And this guy, he was all fired up. He's an usher now in our church. He's serving. He's there all the time. And it's like, and, and his wife is involved. And so here's this family that God put together because, because there was a mentality that said, we'll do whatever we have to do to help people know, man, there's good news for you. There's good news. So I want to challenge you to be bold to be creative. What you have here is awesome. Continue to support your pastor. Continue to ask, hey, how can we jump in and help? And, and you know what? Sometimes David, he may make great decisions. He may make uh, not so great decisions. You know, I mean, it's, it's hard. You know, it's hard being a, being a pastor. It's hard being a leader. But continue to support him and continue to, to have vision for what this church can be. Because I'm telling you, it, it's amazing to me what God has done here with this group of people, especially with you guys and in Espanol coming together as one church. It's a beautiful thing, and I think our town needs more of it. So I want to encourage you with that. You know what? And so here's what I want to challenge you with at the end. Are you evangelical, and are you free? Are you evangelical? Or is today the day that you need to say, you know what? Yeah, I guess you're right. I guess being a Christian isn't about politics. I guess being a Christian isn't about America. I love America, but it ain't about America. Maybe being a Christian isn't about how you feel about guns or whatever, or your opinion on this or that. Being a Christian, being an evangelical in particular, is about believing, really believing, that there's good news, that sin can be forgiven, and that I'm a messenger of that. And the second thing I'd ask is, are you free? Are you free? Or if you start passing your own laws about what, what you should and shouldn't do, like, you know, how you, the ways that you should and shouldn't try to read. Do you, do you throw rocks at other churches? Well, they're, all they do is care about, you know, uh, reaching, you know, they'll do anything to reach people. and they're, These people aren't biblical. When you get past that stuff, when you say, listen, we have a mission, and God has called us to this place, and we are free to, to be creative and to be innovative and to meet in movie theaters and to do whatever we have to do and to, and to support the beautiful, I mean, amazing Sir, I, I, I'm just blown away by even the, like how many young people are up here. You know, it's great. Not all of them are young, but most of them are young. <laughs> and man, that's like, that's so great to see that. And say, could you be a part of something that's rogue, man, that's different, that's outside of the norm? And that's what you are because you're evangelical and you are free. Let's pray together. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, today, maybe today is the day that you say, you know what, I get it. And, and, and maybe you never heard it like that. Maybe you, today is the day you surrender your life to Jesus and you say, you know what? If there is a good news message that I can be forgiven from sin, then I want it. Then right where you are, right where you are, just say to God, God, I believe that you have good news for me and I want it. I believe that you can forgive me and I need it. I confess to you that I could never stand before you claiming anything on my own. But right now in this movie theater, a place where stories are told, I believe the greatest stories I've ever heard has been told. 
that the God of the universe became one of me, became one of us, so that I can live. Thank you for taking away my sin. Thank you for taking away that which is killing me, so I can live with you. Tell him that. Maybe today you're somebody who's been like, yeah, I've been a Christian for a long time, but quite frankly, I've been kind of mad at the world, or I've been adding other things into Christianity, what it means, and you're only a Christian if you do X, Y, and Z. And I miss the message. I miss the core. This is a wonderful time of repentance to say, God, I don't want to be like that. Help me cross those, those political lines. Help me cross those ethnic lines. Help me cross those socioeconomic lines. To my brother and my sister. God, that you love that you made, just like me. God, help me to be free. Help the gospel to be fresh in my heart so that I can see new ways of reaching people. May I own this mission. Own it. Because your blood flows through my veins. In Jesus' name.